This conference will now be recorded. Uh, welcome everybody to the MPF webinar, uh, part of a series of webinars we're presenting to help firms, firm leaders through the uh, pandemic crisis we're all dealing with. It's really rocking our worlds. And this is our second uh, webinar and we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Larry Richard, uh, the world's preeminent expert on the lawyer personality and the psycho psychology of leading lawyers. So Larry, thank you so much for giving us your time this afternoon and sharing with us your insights, advice to uh, leaders of law firms in these turbulent times. Uh, this session is recorded. It will be archived on the Managing Partner Forum website featured in our newsletter. Um, as most of you know, I, I run this Managing Partner Program and we're all about helping uh, firm leaders be more effective in a very challenging role. We do a leadership conference. We do a, uh, a weekly e-newsletter and from time to time present webinars like this. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce, most of you know, Uri Gutfreund, who is uh, sort of our co-host through these webinar sessions. Uri leads uh, roundtables of managing partners, primarily in the New York, New Jersey region, which is really on the front end of this pandemic. Uh, we met on the speaking circuit some years ago. And uh, like me, Uri's out there talking to a lot of groups, firm leaders about uh, being more effective in the leadership role. And finally, our panelists today, our featured speaker, I should say, uh, Dr. Larry Richard. And I've had the uh, privilege of knowing Larry for a good many years as well. Uh, both of us are old timers these days. And uh, Larry is the founder of a company called Lawyer Brain, and it's based uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, Larry spent some time with Altman Weil, Hildebrandt before launching his consultancy. He uh, writes a blog called What Makes Lawyers Tick. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, lawyers are uh, a bit different than most people, and Larry's really honed in on that. He went to law school, spent a couple of years, five or six, at big law, and decided he'd go on and get his psychology degree at Temple University, and uh, has been working with lawyers, law firms for decades, and as I mentioned, is, is widely recognized as the world's leader on, on what makes lawyers tick and the psychology of leading lawyers. So um, we're going to ask Larry to present some opening remarks and uh, kind of open-ended share with us his guidance to leaders of smaller mid-sized law firms. Uh, and then we solicited a, a bunch of questions from people who signed up for today's program. About 156, I believe, was our number. And uh, we invite them to share with us how they're dealing with the issue. Um, in this particular series of questions, we asked about how they're handling stress, how their lawyers are handling stress, how the support staff's handling stress and anxiety. Um, and then we asked people to offer some questions. And we're, uh, Uri and I will go back and forth and uh, uh, entertain some questions from our registrants. Uh, so we're really honing in on, on what they're thinking about. Uh, we'll let Larry go after about 45 minutes, and then Uri I, and I will wrap up, um, and uh, on we'll go. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Richard. And uh, uh, this, this, by the way, I don't know if you want to start here, Larry, but uh, the stage is yours. All right. Well, thanks, John. And uh, what you see on the screen is a survey that we did of the people that are uh, signed up for this webinar. And uh, you can see we're asking them to make a guesstimate about the stress level of the attorneys at their firm. And you'll see that uh, with five being the highest level, nobody picked number one, which means no stress at all. So everybody's feeling some stress. It's just a question of how much. And the majority are in the middle or next is uh, four. Uh, but Larry, I'm the, surprised this isn't higher to be honest with you. This is the firm leader assessing how his or her attorneys are dealing with this. I'm surprised we don't see higher numbers yep. here. You? So stress is a tricky thing, John, and a lot of people don't wear their stress outwardly. They feel it mm -hmm. inwardly, especially lawyers, because many of them are introverts. A disproportionate number of lawyers are introverts. So the stress manifests internally. Here, the question is not, do you have any scientific data about the stress level of your lawyers? The question is, what do you think they're experiencing? And there's a tendency um, for us to evaluate others with different criteria than we evaluate ourselves. 
So, okay. you know, you you feel a little bit of stress and you're like, oh my God, I'm so stressed. And you look at other people and you say, oh, you know, they're getting by. <laughs> so we we give different, we have a different set of criteria and that's probably what we're seeing here. And the best evidence of that, if you go to the next slide where we ask about their own stress level. Yes, how much, about the well, this, so this is about staff and I hate to say this, but there may be some some judgments here, possibly sexism, possibly other judgments uh, okay. about, you know, staff, well, they're weaker, they're not as uh, strong mm -hmm. in a crisis. I've had people say things like that to me. There's no evidence for that. I don't know where they're getting that from, but this graph may reflect these biases that we have mm -hmm. built in about staff, because all of this is just speculation about the stress levels. Absolutely. Um, this is hardly scientific. About 90 managing partners weighed in to provide these answers. Right. So uh, now here was our way. next question. This, this is the kicker. Is, this is the kicker. When you ask people, how about yourself? That's data. That's raw data. People are checking in with themselves saying, oh, yeah, well, you, you want to know about my stress. It's off yeah. the charts. <laughs> and so yeah. why, why they wouldn't expect other people to have off the chart stress uh, I think that is explained by the biases that I just alluded to. Otherwise, they would, these would be fairly similar. You're not going to see that much variation between a managing partner and other people when the issue that causes a stress is not a management problem. It's an external threat that we're all facing. So yeah, I just, I, I just sorry, one, comment, one comment I just have, which is, you know, as this drags on, and as you as you started, John, in New York, we've we've been at the tip of this. So we've we're already in week three of this crisis that that at least is going to exist for at least another three to four weeks minimum. Uh, I recently had some managing partners express that after so many weeks, and, and Larry, maybe you can comment how time. You know, this is a crisis that uh, is unusual in that it started. It's been going for a significant amount of time no end in sight, at least another three weeks. I, I had two managing partners on a call yesterday, in fact, who said it finally got to them. And I feel like they, they're almost at the end of their rope. And I don't know if you're seeing more of that, Larry, but they're, they're at the end of their rope. And they confided in our round table of about eight of their peers that they, they, they had a break. I mean, and I don't know, you know if there's much data on long-term stresses, um, not in my recent past, but um, ha, ha, how can people handle that? If you can add that to your comments, because so, that I am finding so there, there are a couple of, let me answer Uri's question first, and then I'm going to uh, jump into the material that I had prepared. But right. that's a very good question to start us with, Uri. First of all, this crisis is very different from all the other crises you can think of. Think of hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, car accidents, they all have a moment of crisis and an ending. Right. We can see the ending. We know that a hurricane causes damage and then there's going to be weeks of immediate damage and repair and then some longer term cleanup, but we know what the trajectory of that is. Uh, car accident, we know what to expect from the aftermath of that type of incident. We have no idea where this is going. There's unlimited uncertainty in the minds of everybody. That's thing one. Thing two, as soon as this thing starts affecting us and, we, and it dawns on the leaders of firms, oh my God, there are things I need to be doing now. There are pressures coming from younger lawyers, coming from staff. Will I have a job? Are you going to cut my draw, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are things that leaders have to do to figure out these very practical issues. And a lot of the attention the first week or two has been on addressing these practical issues, getting things in place, looking for resources where people may need them and so forth. And we get to a point around week two where people kind of sit back and take a deep breath and go, Whew, now what? And they look around, they take stock of their own situation. They go, oh my God, this is real. And it's affecting me and my family as well. I haven't even been focusing on that. And it's in that moment of taking stock that I think it really starts to sink in. 
in addition, the legal profession is not just any, um, you know, Jack or Jill out there in the in the U.S. This is a profession that has extra vulnerabilities in a crisis like this. The Harvard Business Review had a study earlier in the year cover story showing that lawyers are the loneliest occupation. The legal profession uh, was was um, has had multiple studies showing that lawyers have an elevated level of depression. Lawyers have an increased substance abuse problem as documented by the American Bar Study in 2016. So we have a lot of documentation of the vulnerabilities of lawyers that are elevated above those same vulnerabilities of the general population. And one of the main contributors to that is the fact that what we do for a living and what we were all trained in in law school is to look for problems, to think what's wrong and what could go wrong and all of that. And that's what we do to protect our clients. But the research in psychology shows that that kind of negative thinking translates directly into negative feelings and puts us at risk for depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and relationship problems. So those are, and loneliness, which is part of the depression spectrum. So those are all real, palpable vulnerabilities, and managing partners are not any more immune from those than rank and file lawyers are. And so when they sit and take stock at that moment of, you know, having a breather, they're going to be vulnerable like everyone else is, maybe more so. So that, that, you know, that's part of what's going on, but it's certainly something we can't ignore. Now, let me back up. I want to start by explaining that there are some well-known psychological variables that are at play here that we should all understand as leaders. There are three basic human needs that we all have that are being disrupted by this crisis. The first one is the need for predictability. We all have a need to be able to know what's gonna happen next. And we all want to make sure we don't have the opposite of predictability, which is not just unpredictability, but chaos. And the, the reason that's so important the, is, is that the way, let's, let's say it this way, all human beings have a set of circuitry in our brains designed 24 seven to scan our environment and to make sure that there are no threats. And those, the, the detection of a threat is going to take over our attention. Anything else that we're paying attention to at the time will give way to alert, alert, there's a potential threat in your environment. What's the mechanism that the brain uses to do that testing of its environment constantly? And the answer is it tests for change. It's always looking to see, is anything changing? And it's not just change in general. The brain looks for three kinds of change. Any one of them can trigger a high alert. One, change that is sudden makes our brain go, uh-oh. Number two, change that is not within our control. And number three, change that has a serious threat of death or serious harm. The crisis we're facing today ticks all three of those boxes. Any one would be enough to get us into high alert. This right. crisis ticks all three of the boxes. So it's no wonder that people are on edge. We have uncertainty about our own health. We have uncertainty about the health of those around us. We have uncertainty about our economics as a consequence. 401ks are going down, 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 down. We have uncertainty about the economics of those we care about. We have uncertainty about the overall US economy and its health. We have uncertainty about the election. We have uncertainty about many other things that two weeks ago weren't on our radar screen. So our brain is just in overdrive coping with uncertainty. And that's not all, that's just one of the three needs. What's the second need? It's the need for control, the mm -hmm. feeling that uh, we have a need to feel like we make choices that are meaningful every single day. We go at, we get up and we go to our workplace and we want to feel like something I'm doing in my work feels like 
I have a choice. I have uh, the ability to have discretion about things that affect my existence, my experience. And our choices have been somewhat constrained. We've been asked to work at home. We can't go to sporting events. We can't go to concerts. We can't hang out with friends. We can't go to certain places of business. Uh, those constraints are making us in general feel stressed out, but we're not people in general. Lawyers have, of course, according to my research, we have a dramatically elevated need for autonomy. Right. And that higher need for autonomy means that we're much more sensitized to the loss of autonomy than the average person is. Mm -hmm. So in today's climate, constraining us in that way makes our brains go, uh-oh. Now, some people might say, hey, wait, but you're working at home. That gives you some more choices. It's more informal. You have a lot more choices there. And there's some truth to that. But human brains are designed to pay more attention to and to place more importance on things that are bad than things that are good. And so the loss of our choices in the workplace, the brain interprets as much more significant than the game. Larry, we lost your sound. Your sound is off. Uh, John, you want to pause the recording? Uh, yes. Even the lawyers have this learned. conference will now be recorded. Sorry for uh, sorry for the tech uh, snafu, folks. But we're back with Larry. Hopefully, things are worked out. All right. Thanks, John. So, as I was saying, the third need uh, after the need for predictability and the need for control or choice is the need for connection. And traditionally, uh, I've noticed an interesting thing in the legal profession. We have a thing about relationships. We, we treat them as touchy-feely, as trivial, as worthy of ridicule. We minimize them. We act like they're unimportant. And What's interesting is in the old days, prior to 1998 or so, we didn't have a lot of data on that, so they could get away with that. But we now have a solid 20 years of research, including a lot of neuroscience, and it tells us pretty clearly relationships are not only important, they're among the most important variables in producing all the things that human beings want. Life satisfaction, work satisfaction, engagement, long-term healthy relationships, even longevity and, and a good immune system, which in a, in a time where you're trying to avoid a crisis, that's a pretty important thing. So relationships matter and they matter hugely and they've been disrupted by this crisis. We work in offices where the informal time, the time spent around the water cooler or the coffee machine or poking your head in somebody's office, those little moments are actually quite important and we've lost them. In addition, because lawyers are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Harvard Business Review mentioned that uh, did a study or reported a study that, that was done at Berkeley about loneliness and the legal profession came in as the most lonely occupation. So we're already sitting ducks for loneliness. And when you take a potentially lonely lawyer and have him or her work at home, if they're solo, if they're working alone, they're at risk for the, the problems that lonely people experience, which includes uh, stress and depression. Um, so these are serious issues. So what can we do as leaders about these issues? The first thing I wanna recommend is that as leaders, we need to put on our own oxygen masks first. Whenever you talk to your people, whether it's a daily, regular call, a weekly call, um, even emails, you can end up unwittingly channeling your own anxiety and unsettling the lawyers in your firm. And that's the last thing you want to do. So by paying attention to your own well-being, your own psychological well-being, your own mental health, um, you are helping to ward off 
the problem of accidentally conveying anxiety or or worse to your personnel. Um, and I can talk at the end about ways that you can do that. Um, there are some very specific ways. Uh, John, have you sent the article to the participants, my article uh, to the participants? Yes, um, we will be sending the article immediately after the webinar. And as well, when we feature this in our newsletter, we will have a okay. PDF okay. that will include the two articles you sent. Right. Uh, as so well one as article, the polling data and some other little bits and pieces. Great, because one of those articles is aimed at leaders and what leaders can do to manage the crisis. Uh, the other is, actually I'm hearing an echo now, could you guys, hmm, you can't mute because that will, uh, you could put in an earbud that would stop the echo from happening. Uh, I'm good. All right, I'll just I, press I, I, on the hear echo. Yeah, everything I say I hear coming back from one of your microphones. Um, anyhow, in the first article, I talk about the things that leaders can do to manage the anxiety and the consequences of these needs being disrupted for the people in their firm. The second article is specifically aimed at individuals, not just leaders, but all lawyers and staff. What can you do individually to manage anxiety and that sort of thing? Um, so what can you do in terms of the disruption of predictability? There are a couple of things. First, as an individual, you as a leader and anyone that you lead, you can encourage them to create a ritual create a regularity in the, the things that they do daily. So for example, get up at the same time, go to sleep at the same time, have a morning ritual, even if you're not in the custom uh, of having one. Um, my wife and I go for an hour walk at the end of every day. We've made it a ritual. And it's really reassuring to have that thing to count on. Um, doing things that are regular like that, Tell, send signals to your brain that there's some predictability, even though we can't control the external predictability, we can control our own predictability in that way. Secondly, have a check-in call or video with your people. Some have, some of you have firms that are too big to have everybody participate in a two-way, but that's okay because what you can do is have a top-down call and then have somebody curating comments by chat and pick four or five people during your call to weigh in so that you give the sense of community to everyone listening. It's not just a leader talking, you know, um, monotonously to everyone else. You're having some give and take. Um, you can also encourage people that are leaders, leaders of practice groups or subgroups or affinity groups to set up their own conference calls and videos. This is better than email messaging because email is kind of flat and emotionless. And these phone calls or better yet video calls build community and connection, which helps restore some of that loss. Uh, but it also lowers predict unpredictability because of that same thing. John, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, I was going to add, is video that important? Yes, video is quite important because the the primary sense, we have five senses. We gain more information through the visual medium than any other sense. Mm. It's our most important one. It occupies more brain cells than the other senses do combined. Um, it's overall the number one modality. So video gives you that visual. It allows you to feel more connected. So yes, it's very important. Yeah, we all um, should have invested in Zoom uh, a couple of weeks ago, huh? Yeah, there you go. Um, other things that you can do to reduce unpredictability. Um, encourage people, and by the way, those calls, it's helpful if you do them at the same time on a regular basis. So the regularity of having uh, an expectation, oh, this is when our check-in call is, is also soothing to the brain. Another thing you can do is 
point out to people what hasn't changed, what is stable, what's still mm -hmm. ongoing. It could be business services resources. It could be uh, connections with clients. It could be uh, things on your web. Whatever is stable and continues, don't, don't think to yourself, oh, well, people already know that. No, they may know it, but mm -hmm. knowing it passively is not the same as paying attention to it. It's all about our attention. When our brains pay conscious attention to something mindfully, our brain interprets that as more important. So if you can get your people to start paying attention to things that haven't changed, their brain interprets those things as important and it starts soothing the anxiety that was produced by the crisis being unpredictable. Um, so those are a couple of things that you can Sure, Stupid questions about video. If a firm leader decides, for example, we, Uri and I learn about town halls that, that many firms are, are exercising once a week, perhaps, mm -hmm. and people can call in and ask questions of firm leadership, uh, maybe a, a daily video message from the managing partner to everybody gets blasted mm -hmm. out. A lot of ways to do yep. that. Do, would you recommend that the managing partner dress up? And, and and present these formally and a bit rehearsed perhaps or might it be more authentic establish a little more connection if it were done informally uh with less well, rehearsal so the answer to that uh has to do with authenticity and one of the things that we know from the research that constituents place high in importance in terms of trusting their leaders is whether that leader is communicating authentically. Now, there are some limits to that, and there's a very good article by Adam Grant at the Wharton School, which I can send you a link to if you want, John, to you know, distribute that. And he mentions six or seven really good limitations to authenticity. For example, you don't want a leader being so authentic that they look like a basket case, um, even if it's an authentic basket case. Um, so there are some there's some limits to it. But vis-a-vis -vis what you just said, uh, if you're a leader and you're working at home, and you know, especially if you're taking care of kids or you have other things that um, you know yell informal environment, it looks kind of fake if you're sitting there in a suit and tie and your living room is behind you. Um, so I opt in favor of just be yourself, um, you know, be real. And uh, I think that carries a lot of weight. And even going further than that, a lot of leaders on these calls uh, have made a lot of uh, gains in credibility by stopping before they start the video and saying, let me just pan my camera around and show you. I'm in my living room. Here's my golden retriever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll see him walking by and just kind of orienting really the formal. listeners to the space. So it just kind of embraces the informal instead of kind of, you know, freezing up and going, oh, I hope they don't judge me for this. Mm -hmm. uh, much better to be yourself. Uh, in well, you know, calls. lawyers don't like to show the human side so much, you know, they, they got to maintain that uh, air of authority and uh and control well let's say let's and, amend that to say up until recently lawyers haven't liked to expose that but uh humanity is becoming more of a good thing in this crisis um so what can we do with the control and choice issue and that's a simple one anytime you ask something of the people in your firm try to ask it in a way that gives some sort of a choice so it could be an illusory choice. It could be a real choice. By illusory, I mean, uh, let's say you have a child and you want the child to eat broccoli and they don't like broccoli. So what you could say is, do you want to eat your broccoli before you eat your potatoes or after you eat your potatoes? And you're not really giving them a choice about eating the broccoli, but you are giving them a choice. The choice is about timing, not about whether or not. And you can do the same thing as a leader. You can say, I want your time sheets turned in. You can let me know. Do you want to turn them in at the beginning of the week or, you know, for the previous week or at the end of the week before we get to the weekend or something like that? Just giving people simple little choices like that around 
request to do stuff gives that brain the sense of, hey, I do have some choices. How about social connection? Social connection, is, as I said, is so important and it's been disrupted. The first thing is the, the check-in calls, reaching out to people, do them in a way that is either voice call or video because it's more human and try to engage other people as much as you can and give them a chance to weigh in during those calls. Number two, you do this and encourage your lawyers to do this. Check in with everybody, lawyers, staff, friends, family, neighbors. Just call them out of the blue and say, hi, I'm checking to see how you're doing. It's especially good with clients. Um, it's especially important if two things are true, if you have someone who's home alone. Mm. And number two, if the person is in some way vulnerable. If they're sick, if they have a sick parent or family member, if they have uh, some other, um, you know, crisis that they're dealing with, um, check in with them, because this is a time for us to be at our maximum of being human, and our minimum of being cerebral. So it really makes a difference um, because we've all suffered a number of these different losses. And these steps that I'm recommending will go a long way toward restoring those losses. What else can you do? Uh, reach out to those two subpopulations that need some help. Lawyers who have young kids at home who may be struggling with that because it's hard to manage your kids and work at the same time, uh, especially for things that have a designated time like a conference call, and lawyers who are home alone. With the parents with kids situation, I recommend that you invite a subgroup, an affinity group of parents with kids, and invite them to solve their own problems, to talk to each other about how are you coping with yeah. the kids in your home. Let them be the ones, because they're the experts on that issue. On the issue of uh, people who are alone, it's a little trickier because they may be a little bit more sensitive. They don't want to feel like they're being stigmatized. Um, they don't want to feel like somebody's having sympathy for them. So what I recommend is that you think of the two or three or four lawyers who you know in your firm that are working alone, but also have high emotional intelligence, are coping very well, mm. and reach out to them and say, hey, listen, what do you folks think about um, the best way to cope with your colleagues who are like yourselves working alone? We want to look out for them. What are your ideas for it? Do you want to start an affinity group? Do you want to reach out individually to them? Do you want us to reach out to them? What are your ideas? But let them be the, the, the group that initiates the solutions rather than you. You're just the convener uh, of that group. Uh, other things that you can do with social connection. Gratitude is particularly important and very easy. It's low-hanging fruit. The research on gratitude shows that when we are grateful, it increases our connection with other people. And there are two dimensions to gratitude. One is the noticing of gratitude itself. Just being aware, yes, there are things I'm grateful for. Um, in some of the literature, they recommend keeping a gratitude journal where you write down once a week, no more frequently because we tend to get jaded we're, we tend to be grateful for the same things, and if you do it more often, they'll start to lose meaning. But once a week is infrequent enough that it still maintains its meaning. And you keep a journal, and you just write down what you're grateful for. And that alone has a proven beneficial effect for you, the, the writer of things you're grateful for. But the second part is a twofer. It's being grateful and expressing it to the person that you're grateful to. And it usually involves somebody who's done something that puts themselves out on your behalf. So they've given you some benefit you didn't expect, and they put themselves out to do that. And in that case, it can be a simple little thing. You know, they uh, it could be a tech person that helped fix your Zoom so that it was working. And you just want to be sure you thank that person. Little simple thank you goes a long way, especially if it's given in isolation, not being tied to any other thing. You don't want to do, thank you. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention a, a problem with the, you know, the thing you did. Right. No, 
Thank you sh should be completely freestanding on their own. That's the one-on-one -on -one personal. of thought. One-on-one -on -one one -on -one and personal, absolutely. A public thank you attaboy type thing at a... No, no, a no, you don't need to make it public. You don't need to make it public because those often tend to be seen as insincere in law firms. And you want to be very careful about thanking somebody to everybody, uh, unless it's completely spontaneous and genuine. Uh, but you also want to go beyond the mere thank you if the effort somebody made and the amount they put themselves out was unusually uh, large. So if somebody really went to great extent or put their health at risk, for example, to help one of your parents or, you know, did something like that, it's not just thank you. It's, boy, I really, really appreciate what you did for me. And I see that you put yourself out and expose yourself to harm. And, you know, you didn't have to do that. I really appreciate your extending yourself in that way. And it means a lot to me. You know, that type of extended gratitude expression goes a long way to help that person and it also helps you. It builds connection. It's actually one of the things that builds social connection. So would you, let's take Mary, some Q&A. Q yeah, uh, would you recommend in addition to that verbal phone call or I mean, what's the best way to thank? A gift, an email, a text, a phone call, um, a, a handwritten letter, all of those things. So, so the more, the more intimate the thank you, the more meaningful it is in most cases. So calling somebody up, just that person on the line is a very good way to do it because it's very personal and you can feel the connection. Um, having a Zoom connection with one other individual is even better because you can see the person. Um, texting, absolutely not. That's almost an insult because it's such an impersonal medium. Um, Sending a handwritten thank you note, yes. Typed email, no, not so good. You want, in effect, when you're thanking somebody for something you're grateful for, it's really um, helpful if you evidence ways that you yourself put yourself out in the effort to thank them. Writing a handwritten note puts you out a little bit, and it's a way of conveying through your actions I, I'm with you. I'm reciprocating. So would it's a very good way to do it. Would you recommend gifting as well? Or is that mm, not something no. you... Because, because gifting runs a risk. See, there's, there's two main motivations for our behavior. There's social motivation and there's commercial motivation. And when you give a gift, it can easily devolve into a very ambiguous motivation. Did you give me that gift because you're grateful or did you give me that gift because you're keeping track and you think that evened out the score? Mm. That's not a really good, because that latter one is commercial and that tends to be very impersonal. Right. So gifting, no, stay away from gifts. If you're grateful to somebody, a heartfelt thank you is much more important than any sort of a gift. Unless it's a gift like you know, you, you personally did a needlepoint for somebody or you did something that, again, puts yourself out in a way you didn't have to do to thank them. That can be very meaningful. I guess what I'm hearing is heartfelt, authentic, genuine, personal, right. direct is, is, the, right. is the takeaway here. And That's right. Um, really and and, and to, 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 to undercut... The question that somebody might ask, because I actually had this on one of my seminars, how about faxes? Um, <laughs> I hope nobody ever asked that, but uh, the answer is no. <laughs> um, all very good practical guidance. And I, I think it's hard for a lot of lawyers to to show that authenticity and that heartfelt appreciation uh it it, it, so, it is so it's john let me just uh, uh i had a uh, a stopping point at the top of the hour to jump on another call but i have just uh done the impossible and while i'm talking i actually emailed the person uh and i have 10 extra minutes but let's, i have a hard a hard stop at 10 after so let's do q a
Sure. Yeah, you know, Uri and I'll come back and forth. And these are questions provided by our, our uh, participants in today's program. And the first one uh, speaks to uh, rules and the enforcement of rules and proclamations you might make as firm leader, like we're shutting down the office, everybody work at home. And Uri have, and I have heard a number of situations where senior lawyers in particular don't want to go home. Right. And they come in um, in violation of, of, of some government mandates and, 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 and firm imposed rules. And in some cases, insist that the support staff come in too. Um, how far do we go to enforce rules and, and um, you know, mandates within the firm in this, in, in these, in, in this time? So enforcing is a tricky thing because when you try to enforce a rule with a lawyer, um, because of our high autonomy, most lawyers will actually dig their heels in more. So it's a countervailing uh, strategy to try to enforce as the top down, I say so. Uh, that generally backfires. What you want to do, um, the most successful strategy is to try to invoke the do it for the team rather than because you you know, want to do it or because I want you to do it. Uh, and try to do it in an empathic way. You know, partner X, I'm, I'm sure this feels like an intrusion to you. And, and you're probably, you know, like most of us, skeptical about the wisdom of this re restriction. And I understand why you want to serve your clients. All of that makes sense to me. And we're trying to play the odds here in favor of everyone's health. We're dealing with a literally life or death threatening illness. And I don't know if we're going too far, but I would really appreciate your supporting me in trying to do what I'm doing to help save the lives of people and, and protect our health. And for that reason, we ask you to do this, not for yourself, but do it for others. So that pitch is, it's not gonna work 100% of the time, but it's gonna work a lot more often than do this or else. Okay, Barry? Yeah, thank you, Larry. Yeah, the question that, that it would be great if you can address you know, that last question really dealt with um, almost altruistic um, motivations, meaning I think under normal circumstances or you, you can find a side why somebody might do that. And in a certain world, that's that's admirable, as you pointed out. But w what we're finding, and it, this has been consistent on our roundtables, is that the crisis has brought up the best in some people and and boy i mean really this is as you said life and death and people have stepped up and they've become leaders in their firm uh formal or informal but the opposite and if you could comment on the opposite where we're, we're, there are some and some these are very senior lawyers other partners executive committee who are you know at, at one example this lawyer gives is that they're at their um, management committee and somebody starts talking about origination fights. I mean, that's mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. bad acting under normal circumstances. And um, ha ha under stress, everybody's under stress. What advice can you give us and the firms on how to deal with that? And this is, uh, uh, by the way, uh, lower performers, the and this is the easy solution, they're getting terminated. I could tell you the lowest level employees, if they're exhibiting these kinds of um, attributes are often the first to be let go if in these tough times. But these are employees that either longtime partners, uh, major contributors, um, we're cutting people a little more slack. These are usually very good performers, but something, as you say, flip the switch and they're acting really bad. What, can, what advice can you give us, Larry? So the first piece of advice, Uri, is compassion because uh, compassion, based on my research, is in relatively short supply in many lawyers. There, there are exceptions to that, but the, it's not as widespread as it is in the general public. And it's really what we need here because there are many, many ways that anxiety and stress and anticipatory grief manifest themselves among individual lawyers. 
And one of them is, let me focus my attention on something I can control. And originations is something that you can control. So it's a natural gut response to wanting to feel in control. And you have to respond to it more psychologically. Instead of arguing and arm wrestling around the originations issue, what I might say to that person is, I hear your concern about originations. Can we stop for a second and just step back? I want to find out how everybody's doing. And then I'm going to talk about myself first before I ask you to speak, because I want to set a level of role modeling for my vulnerability to talk about what I'm going through and my stress. And then I'm probably going to pick on somebody that I know is fairly emotionally intelligent who can do the same and get a groundswell going, get a get a um, a bandwagon effect going of two or three partners who are sharing their own ways of expressing that anxiety, because it comes out in a lot of different ways. And then eventually you want to invite the person who's talking about originations to talk about that. And nine times out of 10, they're going to be realizing themselves, it ain't about originations, it's about the yeah. stress. And you can be very light in going about that in this indirect way that I'm talking about. You don't have to confront them. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You want to feel compassionate for them and try to give them the support of saying, look, you're among friends and we're all in a new time. We're coping with something that we've never coped with before. And it's okay to be human. Hmm. Larry, you've talked about emotional intelligence a couple of times yeah. and how important that is. This. It, it, this time. Um, That's right. Lawyers tend not to be real high on the uh, emotional intelligence factor. If I want to learn to become more emotionally intelligent, more compassionate, more sensitive, is, is, is there some place I can go? Is there something I can read that will help me be more authentic and compassionate? So it just so happens, John, that um, I wrote a book chapter last year for an ABA book that came out um, that the ABA is uh, selling right now. And I, I will, shame on me, I forget the title of it, but I'll send you the uh, a copy of the title that has all that info. And um, I, the chapter in there is specifically about what is emotional intelligence and how do you build it? So I'll send you that as a resource, and you can feel free to distribute that to uh, the participants. Beautiful. We appreciate that. And I'm looking at the time, Larry. We could go on all day uh, hearing your guidance, and um, perhaps we'll do another one of these um, in, a, in a couple of weeks, couple of months. And as kind okay. of are, well, really settle in. And um, on behalf of, of well, thanks, all of uh, thanks for, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, John. It's my pleasure to to talk to folks and and uh, glad to help out. Well, we thank you. I know your advice is is highly valued, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, this fall, hopefully, if our meeting comes off in Atlanta. And in the meantime, stay well. And thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Uri, let's stick around. I'm going to pull back up our screen and uh, you and I can close out here. Uh, if people uh, want to stick around and hear what we have to say. But um, there's Larry. And again, uh, go check out his blog. We'll include some of his articles in the uh, handout materials. Uh, good stuff. Take a look at it. Uh, thank you, uh, Larry. Um, the survey that many of you completed coming into today's program, we asked what you're doing to uh, rein in your expenses. Everyone's concerned about revenue and uh, getting paid and, and keeping our productivity up, but also trying to uh, rein in some expenses where we can. Um, Uri, this is what our folks had to say. Uh, your comments on this, uh, yeah. are you missing anything? What are you hearing on your round tables? Yeah, I mean, I'm hearing an interesting, I'll tell you, two things that have come about uh, that I think tell a little bit more of a picture here. Uh, number one, 
uh, I am seeing an increase in partner draw reductions. You know, our survey showed 30%. I think anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot of firms uh, step up. Now, um, I think part of that is they're anticipating uh, more cuts in, in lawyer salary and associates, and they want to get ahead of, look, we're coming to you for a 20% pay cut, associates and junior partners, but you should just know that the senior partners have already cut their draws. So I think it's, it's part of that same trend, but it, it's more fuller of the story. Um, I, I, I think the uh, postponing major investments is a huge one. Um, and I think, John, I think you would caution, you know, there's some things to cut and marketing is probably not one of them if you want to keep your business going. So um, yeah. I think there's that risk, isn't there? Absolutely. And this happened in 2008 when yep. uh, firms went into expense slashing mode yep. uh, to preserve short term profitability. And uh, in so doing, they kind of, in my view, were a bit penny wise, pound foolish mm -hmm. uh, as they start to uh, gut the marketing budget, gut the firm retreat, the associate development. Uh, these are important things. Uh, so think strategically. Uh, think longer term and beyond the pandemic and, you know, let's not kill the goose. Uh, yeah. John, just yeah. something, something I'm also seeing, and this sort of took me by surprise, but it makes sense. The, the concept of letting people go and, and the concept of furloughing employees, that sort of sounds different. It means legal, different legal things in different jurisdictions. But what it really means is the conversation with the employee is that we're, we're putting you on pause. We're temporarily letting you go. And it could be because the, the PPP loans are starting soon, or we expect, hope they will, uh, but we expect to bring you back. And so much so, John, is that what we're seeing, and this is really against all historic norms, is that when, th when these employees are furloughed, they're not taken off the email system. They're kept on the firm, you know, informal list and uh, they're being on those Zoom chats, you know, those those firm, you know, calls where we've been talking about the furloughed employees are still there. And, and, and that sort of builds the team and keeps the team, keeps the gang together for when the what we hope will be the switch turns back on. And so I'm seeing a little of that. And, and I think that's that's a positive sign, John. You know, a couple of folks in our roundtable conversations have shared that, that when when we have hit a down period and 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 held our staff and invested in our staff, the yeah. goodwill we build, the the loyalty, uh, the work ethic we engender by taking care of our people when times are tough, yeah. really pays back in 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 spades when things recover. Yep. And um, people appreciate you're taking care of them in down times. Um, yeah. This was a multiple choice question we presented, and we had a drop down of things that I think yep. Marie and I thought, you know, firms are most commonly doing. And then we had another. And then in this next slide are some of the other things that uh, you all told us you were doing uh, in the short term. The line of credit, I know you've talked about that, Uri, and certainly yep. we have the government's. Uh, a program coming into play and yep. uh, lots of ambiguity around that as people to scramble to learn about you know what's covered what they can pull from the uh the uh, federal government's uh ppp program uh but we're seeing most people trying to hold hold their lawyers hold their support staff long as they can and and finding other ways to trim around the edges uh, we're going to be doing our next webinar with hbr consulting and they're going to talk specifically about where to where to kind of manage expenses through this process without destroying your firm uh, in, as you do so. Uh, these are some of the lessons as well. Uri and I wanted to share with our audience about some of the things we've learned over the past couple of weeks through our uh, roundtable conference calls. Uh, Uri does uh, a series of calls with firms, New York, New Jersey. Uh, we do them uh, for, for firms that attend our annual conference and have these ongoing calls and folks have really stepped up and participated. And we've, we've learned some very interesting things we thought we'd want to share. 
Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Larry said it. Uh, people are anxious. They, they want to hear from you. And uh, there's some strategies we've sir, heard uh, deployed quite effectively. Or anything you want to chat about? Uh, we have another page of these lessons learned coming up. Sure. Yeah. What do you got on this page you want to embellish on? Yeah, well, I just want to underscore, Larry uh, mentioned it earlier, and we've talked a few times. I'm seeing firms have morning check-ins. It's 9.15 a.m. Everybody gets on the screen, even larger firms where there's 100 little dots. It's it's almost like you've walked into the office and it's, good morning, John. Uh, right. It just starts the day. And I even have some firms who report they're doing it twice a day. They're doing wow. a morning and they're doing a three o'clock or a four o'clock where it's almost like, good morning, good night. And, and it just, it, it's starting, it's all part of that building that culture. And a lot of firms, as you know, this points out a few of them, but really firms are struggling. You know, yeah. when, when they were together, it was so easy to keep the culture going. Now it's, it, you know, it's almost like John and, and maybe a future webinar we can cover a culture program. I mean, it, it nothing happens by itself anymore. You know, uh, yeah. And being very, very deliberate and strategic yeah. about this. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, long-term focus here. Um, we found that firms that had made the investments in technology, remote working, oh, certainly. Uh, to the cloud are, are getting through this and, and, and setting up the work at home situations much more uh, uh, efficiently than firms that haven't made those investments. Firms with disaster plans find them very helpful. We heard that from uh, oh, yeah. a couple of managing partners working with firms uh, in coastal communities like right. in Pensacola, yeah. Florida. Yeah, they were ahead, John. They had the template for kicking a plan into action. Of course, yes. now, as we pointed out, those plans are now uh, long term, but, uh, but they had a head start, no doubt. Mm -hmm. you know, Larry talked about the importance of video. Uh, so if you're not already set up, you need to go there and use it. Use it. Uh, some firms we learned to bring a little levity. Uh, Larry talked about this. And uh, uh virtual happy hours and meet my pets and meet my kids and and uh you know these sorts of things uh really really help uh here's one, question, a one caution on, one caution on the video is firms report it's stodgy hokey at first but they push through three or four and that seems to be the magic number when you get to three or four it sort of becomes oh hey it's that thing again as opposed right. to everybody standing stiff in front of the camera uh, some other things, Larry talked about client outreach. You, you, yes. you have time on your hands, hey, then right. pick up the phone, let people know you care. The authenticity is very, very important. Um, I'm looking at our time here, uh, uh, Uri, and uh, yep. we're almost out. Anything jumping at you from this page? Um, no, but watch those billable hours. Uh, people are saying weekly, I say daily. I um, do too. It's it's really there's no sense you know there's no sense of the guy down the hall how long he's he's there that's gone uh, people are still holding on to that oh I know what John's doing oh no you don't <laughs> so right, right. Uh, this almost kind of <laughs> Larry I think it, it, we didn't we we put this together uh, at, at our first webinar two weeks ago yeah. uh, Larry certainly reinforced how important these things are. And um, I think he's spot on. Some additional resources. There's plenty out there. Uh, Ballard Spar is doing a nice job with a daily update. Uh, Auric as well. Um, you know, I think at this point, if your firm's gearing up, it's COVID law alerts. It might be a little late. Um, being first out, brevity, relevance are important. Uh, and here are some of our resources we're trying to put in play uh, to help you all. Uh, as firm leaders get through these difficult times. Our first webinar we did, it was just Uri and I, uh, we presented that um, just because we we care and, and, and we, we uh, want to help. Um, we've got handouts. Uh, Larry's articles he mentioned will be included. We're going to be doing our third installment on April 15th, 2 o'clock, featuring folks from HBR Consulting. So stay tuned for details regarding that. As well, if you participate in our leadership conferences, 
Uh, we have our uh, listserv, which is very, very active right now, where managing sure. partners can learn with and from each other and share lots of stuff. And then we do uh, conference calls as well. And we're stepping up the frequency of those. And, and it's interesting how many people are kind of stepping up and participating sure. in these things. Um, and we're, 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 we're just delighted to be in a position to, to help you guys out. So those are some of the things we're trying to do. Um, and our leadership conference, we postponed it. Uh, originally early May, we're pushing it back to uh, the end of September, 1st of October. And uh, hopefully we can pull it off. We'll see. Uh, but we have a few uh, spaces opened up if you want to uh, want to register. This is our contact information. Great. Um, great. I know Uri would be very uh, happy to help you out uh, if you contact him directly, as would be myself and I'm sure Dak Larry Richard. Uh, good guy and uh, surprisingly available if you reach out to him. So. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Uri, thank you. Thank you, John. We'll see you in two weeks and stay safe. And um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be back in touch with everybody. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, John. Thank you, Uri. Bye-bye now.